Our first reading this morning comes from Matthew 6, 25 through 33, and can be found in your pew Bibles on pages 761 and 762. Listen to the word of the Lord. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things will be added to you. This is the word of the Lord. I'd like to read to you some scripture from the Old Testament. This comes from Psalm 34. I'll read the entirety of the chapter to you. And listen out, or listen to the themes that David speaks to here. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord. And he answered me and delivered me from all of my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall lack no good thing. Come, O oh children, and listen to me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life? And loves many days that he may see good. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off their memory from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears them and delivers them out of all of their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all of his bones. Not one of them is broken. Affliction shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants, and no one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, let me begin my message by praying. Let's all pray together. Let's bow our heads. Father, we have gathered to worship you. And as a part of our worship, we're studying your word. 
It's so wonderful. Help us in this time by your spirit just to see how wonderful it is and how it was written not only for God's saints long ago, but for God's saints right now, for the people in this sanctuary. We thank you, and it's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Well, we live in a pretty tumultuous time. I think politically, these are about as crazy a days as I think I've seen. We might even be tempted to think that we're unique. But that wouldn't be true. Because this psalm that we're going to study today was actually written during a very tumultuous time. One that not only rivals, but was more dramatic than our own. There's not a one-to-one correlation exactly with what's happening right now. But Israel was in chaos. Because this psalm lines up with a time in David's life when he was running from the king. David, while he had been anointed as, as, as the leader of the nation, he had been anointed by Samuel, there was one problem. You might remember the story. Saul did not want to give up his power as king. He did not want to go. And he was hostile enough towards David to have him killed. A tremendous crisis ensued in the life of Israel, and people were polarized. They were lining up, dividing uh, the individuals, the the whole nation into David's camp, into Saul's camp. But David really had no choice but to flee, to preserve his own life. And we're told in 1 Samuel 21 that there was a, a stage of the game where David was so desperate to get away from Saul that he thought it would be a good idea to go into the country that was controlled by the sworn enemies of his nation, the Philistines. So he decided to run to Gath, the capital of that country. But not only was it the capital, it was the hometown of Goliath. Now, you might remember that the last time that David and Goliath faced off, it didn't turn out too well for Goliath. You probably remember from the Sunday school classes that David actually knocked Goliath out with a stone from his sling. And then he actually took the giant sword and he cut off his head. It was a day of utter humiliation and defeat for the Philistines. They had to run from the battlefield that day with their tails tucked between their legs. Yes, it was tremendous victory and triumph for the Israelites, but it was complete humiliation for the Philistines. And that's where David thought it was a good idea to go. I don't understand his strategy at this point. I just don't get it. He must have thought, oh, surely they've forgotten by now. I don't know if he had a disguise or, or what, but he, he goes there. Surely they won't recognize me. He was totally wrong, by the way. They immediately recognized him. We know this guy. They grabbed him. They took him into custody, and they took him before the king of the Philistines. And David realized that he had just left one dangerous situation only to find himself in one that was just as bad. And so he started to panic. He didn't know what to do. And he pretended to be insane so the Philistine king would actually not see him as a threat and maybe have just a little bit of pity on him. Well, the ruse worked. It worked for David, and he was set free. And knowing that he had escaped a situation that could have very easily resulted in his death, he wrote these words. The main point of this psalm, and I've actually written it down on the insert for you, Believers should seek the Lord because they have tasted and seen that he is good. The extent to which we do that, see, experience the Lord's goodness, it depends on how we answer some questions that David speaks to in the next few verses. I've listed them there in your insert, and we'll take them one at a time. How do you praise? Who do you fear? And where do you go? We'll take them one at a time. How do you praise? David makes it clear that the person he praises is the Lord, and he makes it his goal to do so. And this praise goes into 
worship, a reverential awe every day, each moment of every day. David makes a choice. He chooses to bless God and he pursues a sort of inner sense of worship. By doing so, David keeps his eyes on God and not on his troubles, not on his worries and anxieties. David was no stranger, no stranger to anxiety, worry, stress. If you just look at a little bit of his life, you'll see it's just full of troubles. Many of them were the direct result of some bad choices that David made. Yet he chooses to worship. He wants to worship God. He wants to praise him. Now, I find that amazing, but for this reason. David had all sorts of troubles, anxieties, but he doesn't see them as a reason to become bitter or to lose faith in God, but to embrace God even more. Let me restate that. He views his troubles as a reason to praise God. He leans into them. And we can do that too, knowing that God is with us in them. But not only does David make this a personal exercise, but he, he asks for all of God's people to do this with him, to join in. You see, worship begins as a personal exercise. It starts there, but it never ends there. C.S. Lewis made an observation in his book, Reflections on the Psalms. Have you ever noticed how when you're praising something or someone, you almost instinctively start trying to draw others into your praise? Here's an example of what I'm talking about. Let's say that you're looking at some pictures of your kids, your grandkids, great-grandkids, and you're thinking to yourself, I just can't believe how stinking cute these kids are. I just can't believe it. And so what's the next thing that you do? Almost immediately, you try to get others to look at those pictures with you, right? And you're, you're pointing them out. Look at that. Look, can you see how cute that? Look at those dimples. My gosh. Holy moly. We do the same thing with sports, don't we? Look at that slam dunk. Or look at that long pass. He had a touchdown in the last 20 seconds. It saved the whole game. We even do that with pictures and videos that we find online. Funny ones, you know what I'm saying? Now, if we react that way to, to television or social media, how much more should we try to make a habit of encouraging our brothers and sisters to join with us here on Sunday morning? I mean, praise blesses our God tremendously. It, it's, it blesses Him, but it, it does something to us, too. Something is going on in the person. It's extremely important. Here's why I say that. Verse 2 says this, My soul makes its boast in the Lord. I want to take a second to look at this more closely with you. I believe this observation was first pointed out by Tim Keller in a sermon he gave on Jeremiah 9. But I believe the principle actually applies here as well. When it says, I will, my soul finds its boast in the Lord, the verb there is halal. We just sang it a few moments ago. Hallelujah, we praise the Lord. We praise the Lord. And so that's the, the verb that's used here, but it's, it's in a weird format. It's, it's in a form that's actually reflexive. I don't want to get too, uh, too hung up on this, but... The point of it being reflexive, he's not talking about giving praise. He's talking about receiving praise. Not giving, but receiving praise. And where does he get that praise from? The Lord. So another way of looking at this verse is this. My soul finds its praise in Yahweh, or my soul gets its praise from the Lord. This might sound just a little bit weird. Just sound like a little bit, uh, I don't know, odd to you. But stay with me for just a moment. Certainly not praise in the sense of worship, because worship is something due to God alone. 
But what I'm talking about here is praise in the sense of approval or acclaim or blessing. The New Testament actually has a lot to say about praise in this way. I'll just give you a couple of examples. In John 5, 44, we see Jesus chastising the Pharisees for their unbelief, and he says this. I want you to notice how he, he corrects them. You try to get praise from each other, but you do not try to get the praise that comes from the only God. Over in Romans 2.29, Paul writes, A true Jew is one inwardly. His praise is not from man, but from God. There are other verses, but that's just a couple of them. Where am I going with all of this? What am I, I trying to tell you? The praise is very important, so much more important than I think we might realize it's important not only because of who we praise, but where we receive or who we receive our praise from. We worship God both privately and with others, but we also constantly bring to our minds that our true identity comes from that praise that we receive from God. We are part of his family and we hear the words from him, you are my beloved child, and you I am well pleased. And we will hear, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. So how do you praise? Who do you fear? For many of us, when fear touches our lives, it feels like an enemy to be struggled against. And there is good news here. The gospel holds out a wonderful reality. God does indeed free us from our fears. I sought the Lord, verse 4 tells us, and he answered me and delivered me from all of my fears or, or troubles. God frees us from our fears, but he doesn't free us from our fears in the way you might expect him to. Just a few verses later, David writes in verses 7 and 9, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. And then again, he says, oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. Fear the Lord. So in other words, a, lark, a life marked by devotion to God drives out certain kinds of fear, but produces another. So the message that David gives us is this. If you want freedom from your fears, make sure you fear the Lord. Kind of confusing. But I think what he's trying to say here is there's, there's a wrong way to fear and there's definitely a right way. Let's start with a negative first. A wrong way of fearing. I was recently at, at the beach with some members of my family. We were fortunate enough to stay right by the ocean. And when we first got there, my two-year-old granddaughter, Emerson, wanted me to take her out to the beach. She calls me Poppy. Not quite sure where she got that, but just one day started calling me Poppy. I want Poppy to take me out. So I jumped up and volunteered quickly for that. It was about 6 p.m. There was a nice breeze coming off the water. We walked out on the beach. We found a beautiful sunset. The sand was white and powdery. It was pristine. It was a picturesque scene, you know, the kind you might expect to find on a postcard. It was wonderful. I took a deep breath, and I turned to my granddaughter. And I said something that didn't turn out to be too wise. I said, why don't we get in the water? You know, get our feet wet? Well, Emmy's eyes became wide as saucers, and the color drained out of her face. And it was just at that moment that I realized that my great idea was probably not so great at all. Why does he connect taste with it? That seems kind of strange. I think you can argue that of the five senses, taste, 
is arguably the most intimate. I can see, hear, and, well, sometimes I can even smell someone at a distance. Touch, of course, well, that, that requires direct contact, but to taste something, I have to put it in my mouth. The command to taste and see that the Lord is good is God's direction to us to enter in a very close relationship with him, to form a deep bond, a deep connection with him. So you might be asking, how do I do this? How do I taste and see? How do I experience the Lord's goodness? Well, your pastor has some pretty good ideas on that. Here's his doctoral thesis. There's a copy in the library, from what I understand. Engines of Growth. And in it, he talks about some daily spiritual practices, ways we can grow in our ability to savor and enjoy the promises of God. I want you to consider with me what David writes in verses 19 and 20. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. God's people have troubles. But then they, he adds, the Lord delivers them from, from them all. Yeah, I'm with him so far. I'm reading that. I'm with him. But then he throws in a curious line. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. That threw me when I was reading that. almost seemed to be a little bit out of place. But here's where I think he was going with that. You see, David, he was a warrior and had seen his share of God's people die on the battlefield. He knew that sometimes they die badly, and sometimes their bones are indeed broken. What I couldn't figure out is why his words here didn't match what he had seen in the real world. And that was my first clue that something was going on. The Bible also identifies David as a prophet, someone who had the ability to speak gospel truths, even in his situation. In Ezekiel 37, over in Ezekiel 37, we're told a story God raises up a people to himself, a vast army, in fact, but they have no life to them. They don't have any life. They're just a, a, an army of skeletons. Now, resist the urge to start thinking about pirates of the Caribbean, because that's where I went, <laughs> and that's, it's just a distraction, so I'm trying to save you from that. Anyway, God does something mirac even more miraculous. At that point, he breathes life into these skeletons, and then slowly they begin to take on muscle and flesh, and they begin to breathe. This was a picture of resurrection. Resurrection. So it's no surprise that in the New Testament, over in the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verse 36, we are told that none of Jesus' bones were broken during the crucifixion. John goes out of his way to tell us that. It was a picture of resurrection, what God was going to do. But there's something else, too. There's another place where no, no bones were broken. The Israelites were given instructions when preparing the Passover lamb, getting the meal together, that none of the lamb's bones were to be broken. None of the lamb's bones were to be broken. This led Paul to write in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 7 and 8, For Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate. Let's join in the feast. In other words, God in Jesus is the Passover lamb who saves us. So let's not shrink back. Let's not hesitate. Let's join in. Let's join the meal. Or in the way David puts it here, taste and see that the Lord is good. 
Well, friends, every time we, we go to church, every time we read the scriptures in worship or to ourselves, every time we share in the Lord's Supper together, we're taken back to this truth with one another that God sacrificed his son for us and will give us everything that we need in this life to be joyful and satisfied in him. Life may be full of afflictions, may be full of difficulties for us, but our God goes into each of them with us, speaking that truth, you are my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. He is our refuge. We go to him and we know for certain that we are ultimately safe. I'd like to close my thoughts with the story of Alan Gardner. Alan Gardner. He was a member of the British Navy and he eventually became a missionary. He enjoyed some success in Africa, but in 1851 he decided to go to South America and set up a mission there. So he went on a boat to start a new mission, but he and his shipmates were all shipwrecked on a very remote island. He and his companions, they did their best to try to stay alive until a rescue ship came, but one by one, they all died. Eventually, Alan Gardner died as well. He was far away from his home, far away from friends, from family, dying of thirst, dying of hunger, a really gruesome way to go, really gruesome. Now, when the, refu the, uh, the rescue ship did eventually arrive, they found his body and they discovered his prayer journal right next to his body. They opened it up and on the very last page, he had written Psalm 3410. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. And right underneath it, right underneath that, these were the last words that he wrote, were the words, I am overwhelmed with a sense of the goodness of God. How? Seriously, how is something like that possible? I mean, why wasn't he angry? Why wasn't he mad or scared or... I believe Alan Gardner had made the Lord his refuge. He had tasted and seen the Lord's goodness. You see, his experience of God was so deep and profound that it, it simply overwhelmed his experience. He had tasted and he had seen. We can too. Let's pray. Father, in our worship, May we focus upon you and may you give us the grace that we need to praise you with reckless abandon, to receive our praise from you, knowing that we are safe. You are our refuge. Help us to fear you. Help us to go to you continually. And guide us in the rest of our worship that it may be done well unto your glory. It's in your name that we ask these things. Amen.